which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So as you greet your neighbor, welcome them to Fresh Wind Worship and um, just tell them how thankful you are that we were created in Christ Jesus. All righty. Once again, we're happy you're here and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning to worship you and to bring honor and glory to your name. I pray that as we worship, our eyes would be open and our hearts would be as well to what you would have for us to learn this morning and uh, the worship would be pleasing to you. Please give Chapel Mark the words to say that you would have him to speak to us and that we might have um, ears to hear and uh, willingness to take what we learn and put it into practice. Thank you for the day you've given to us. Thank you for this springtime. And we pray that you would um, guide us and direct us as we seek to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. The central message of the gospel is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And um, in the book of Corinthians, uh, that's exactly what Paul said. He said, I resolve to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. I wonder why he said that to the Corinthian church. Well, if you read the book of Corinthians, there was a lot of other things going on that were not focused on Christ and the cross. And so he emphasized that right at the beginning of his letter. And uh, that's the foundation that we need. That's uh, the central message that we need to have every day because, well, we get distracted, don't we, from the, the, the main thing. And as it is said, let's keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And uh, so we're going to sing um, a few songs here. And the first song is At the Cross, At the Cross, where I first saw the light.
Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans and said, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, which is your reasonable worship. And so as we sing this next song, let's um, just give uh, thought to uh, once again giving ourselves to the Lord and say, all for Jesus, all for Jesus. Prayers this week, they're going to have a good, relaxing time away, or at least we're trusting the Lord for that. 
and the queue might even get to watch the Cubs play a couple times, so uh, he's really going to have a good time. Uh, we're glad you're here, and uh, if you're a first-time visitor, welcome. We're glad that you're here this morning. I know we have some visitors. Uh, I hope you enjoy your time here and that you can feel God's presence and uh, the, just the welcoming spirit of the people here at Fresh Wind Worship. Uh, some of you have asked, how do I get a hold of the services on the Cedar Falls cable? And I know sometimes that can be hard to do, but if you take the journal that you get uh, every month and you look to the spiritual care page where we have an article, it will give you the times and the channels to watch our services on CF Cable. Now, we've had a few glitches here and there. We understand that, but that should give you a good idea of where to find them during the week. Or they're on YouTube as well if you're able to access our YouTube channel. If you need help with that, uh, Terry's more than willing to help. Uh, just give her a buzz or stop by the office and she can walk you through that. All right, let's have a word of prayer together and let's ask God to draw close to us this morning. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we could be together this morning. We thank you for your goodness to us. Um, we have to acknowledge it, as we just say, that sometimes uh, our heart can wander. Uh, we can get caught up in the busyness of life, the priorities here on earth, and our hearts can wander away from you. And so we do ask that you would uh, just find our wandering heart, that you would turn our, tune our hearts to sing your praises. And Father, as we gather this morning, I pray that you just cross close, that our Hearts and minds might be anxious and ready to hear what your word says. I uh, pray that you open up our hearts and our minds and to help us to be different when we leave because we're uh, walking closer to you and making decisions to uh, surrender our heart to you. So, Father, thank you for our time here. And as we uh, pray, we want to pray together in the way that Jesus taught his followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, there is no greater joy than to live for Jesus. And uh, he, is the, he is the joy giver. And this song also speaks of him being our master, Lord, uh, our, our boss. He's the one that directs all our decision, decisions and, and steps. And uh, so we let him guide us. Someone asked me this past week, well, how does that happen? How do you do that? How do you let the Lord guide you and direct you and lead you? Well, I thought that was a thought-provoking question. And... Um, you know, a lot of it boils down to faith, doesn't it? To put our faith and trust in him uh, to lead us and guide us. And so, is it any wonder that the psalmist David said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. And he guides us day by day. So, uh, maybe you know this song, maybe not. But I think it will encourage uh, all of us to live for Jesus.
seek to live a little bit more sim simply than we normally would. Uh, we deny ourselves, and then uh, sometimes, and this is what I try to do in this season, is just do a spiritual inventory. Just to try to take some time to look at my life, take inventory of uh, my life, uh, where I've come from, where I'm going, and just get an idea if there's things that need to change in my life. And so this morning we want to think about uh, taking a spiritual inventory and answering the question, why do we need to take a spiritual inventory? Why is it good to do that? And even during the season of Lent, it's really a, an appropriate time to do that in our lives. Well, I'm going to start by this uh, picture of this cute little squirrel. This is a Rocky Mountain ground squirrel. If you were to go to the western part of America and go into the Rocky Mountains, you find these little squirrels there. And uh, these squirrels... Uh, as uh, fall approaches and winters are on the horizon, these little squirrels start to do that. They start to eat. You see that squirrel's eating, and Terry said, what's he eating? It doesn't look like a nut. It's got roots coming out of it. I don't know. Maybe it's last year's nut that started to you know, sprout out. I don't know. But the squirrel's eating something in preparation for winter, eating up its surroundings, if you will. You know, kind of getting fattened up. And then this uh, Rocky Mountain ground squirrel goes into hibernation. And as, science, as scientists have studied these little uh, rodent animals, uh, squirrels, uh, they've noticed something. When this squirrel goes into hibernation, his blood becomes really, really thick, which would be natural, right, in the wintertime. Um, but they're not sure how this squirrel stays alive. Uh, his blood becomes three degrees above zero, or above freezing, I should say. Three degrees above freezing. The blood becomes so thick, becomes so this ammo becomes so lethargic that it just goes to sleep, and the scientists don't know how it stays alive. And now let's think about us spiritually this morning. 
Some Christians spend so much time eating up the things of the world, taking in all that the world has to offer, all the, the temporal things around us, that we begin to take on the values, the priorities, the thoughts, the ideologies, the temperature, if you will, of the world around us, that we go into spiritual hibernation. Barely detecting a spiritual heartbeat. Just a few degrees warmer than the unbelieving world out there. Because we've taken in so much of the world around us, we don't really look too much different or act too much different than those who don't know Christ. There's been times in my life it's been kind of like that. But I've taken the spiritual inventory of Mark. Some of your priorities, some of your values, some of your uh, outlooks don't seem much different than that person that doesn't believe in God. In fact, uh, Dr. Vance Havner said this, as he evaluated the church of his day, you can see that he passed away in 1986, but as he looked around his world and the churches that he was a part of, this is what he said, most church members live so far below the standard that God designs that you would have to backslide to be in fellowship. We are so subnormal that if we were to become normal, people would look at us and think that we're abnormal. You know, that's what happens when you take on the values and priorities of unbelievers. When we start taking our cues from them instead of from God, we begin to look, act, feel uh, just like the unbelieving world around us. We're kind of like that squirrel. We just become very cold. Our spiritual blood doesn't flow. We're just a few degrees warmer than a lost world. And this morning, um, I want to I want to go back to a book in the Old Testament, a prophet called Haggai. When's the last time you read Haggai? You should. And maybe make that your goal during this uh, season to go back and read Haggai. Read the whole book. There's only two chapters. It would take you more than 15 minutes. But this prophet, I love this Old Testament book. I've taught through it, preached through it. Um, I just love uh, the message that comes from here because these people in Judah are right where we're talking this morning. Um, the people of God had drifted away into the world. God warned them over and over again as they were there in Jerusalem, as they were supposed to be worshiping God there at the temple, he said, if you don't repent, if you don't turn and come close to me again, I'm going to raise up um, a leader from Babylon, and he's going to come and he's going to destroy the city, which he did. Uh, we're going to destroy the temple, which he did. And then we're going to take all God's people away from Jerusalem back over into Babylon, which they did. So the city was burned. The temple was destroyed for 70 years. The people of God, instead of being close to him, worshiping him in the city that he promised them, they were over here in Babylon. And so after 70 years in captivity, the people repented and God heard that and he raised up a leader called Zerubbabel and he called Zerubbabel to bring the people back over here to Jerusalem. And so they've been away for 70 years in a sense away from God. And so for the next year, they began to rebuild the city, rebuild the temple. And when the foundation of the temple was rebuilt and the altar of the temp of temple was rebuilt, after one year of work, they received opposition. Uh, they were being ridiculed. They were being persecuted. And so they stopped the work. Now here they were, 70 years away because of the disobedience. They come back after being really excited and zealous. They started to work, and after a year, they stopped the work. And for 15 years, instead of turning to the things of God, they turned back to the, their own things, the things of the world, their own priorities. And, you know, there's kind of a little side note on that. When we get serious about the things of God, we're going to be opposed, just like them. For a year, they were zealous. They were going gung-ho into the things of God, and yet, then they were opposed, and uh, they were persecuted, and they stopped. And so Haggai was sent to confront their coldness. He was a prophet from God. He came to 
to tell them that you need to get back on track. To challenge them spiritually that, hey, you've got to take inventory. You've got to look at where you're at. You've got to look at where you're going. It's not where God wants you. And I want us to remember this, because when they were in exile and the city of Jerusalem was burned to the ground and the altar uh, wasn't there, they couldn't worship God, uh, the people were in danger of not experiencing God's ultimate blessing, because through that temple, through the one that would sit on that throne, would come the people's hope. The Messiah. And so I want us to think about this this morning. This is key. Our priorities and choices have the potential to affect generations to come. What we do today is going to affect our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids and great-great-grandkids. Generations to come will be affected by the way that we live today. That's what Haggai is telling these people. You've got to get back on track. Why? Because God's ultimate blessing would come through David, the one who would be the Messiah. If they just stayed over in Babylon, God couldn't carry out his promises to his people. So we've got to take an evaluation of our priorities. And let's just ask this morning, what things can sidetrack us? Well, I call it the three D's. Disappointment. I talk to people all the time that are disappointed with their life, their circumstances place that God has them. We become disappointed and then we begin to pull back and we don't want to do the work that God has for us. Discouragement. That plays right into, right off the disappointment. We become so discouraged that we don't have courage to keep going. And then discontentment. I'll raise my hand on that one. I look around and I see what everybody else has. I look at my own life and I think, gee whiz. Molly's heard this sermon before. <laughs> gee whiz, I work just as hard as so-and-so and they have that and we have this. Discontentment, disappointment, <clears throat> discouragement. It leads to apathy spiritually. It lures us into the things of the world rather than the things of God. So we have to stop and we have to take a spiritual inventory. So where's your relationship with God at this morning? Are you a little callous to this calling on your life? Maybe some hard times have come and caused your heart to become hard to the work that God wants to do in you and through you. Maybe you've turned away from studying his word. It doesn't seem to be very enticing. And you're looking for the things of the world that seem more exciting or relevant. Maybe you've allowed the busyness and the demands of the world to crowd up your prayer time. Or time to serve in your church, or serve your neighbors, or serve your family. Those are real. Those are real temptations. And you know what? That's where Judah found themselves when he sent the prophet to come and expose their, expose their coldness. You're in hibernation. It's time to get back in the game. And so let's look at Haggai this morning. I think you're going to love this book, and I think you're going to want to read it maybe more than once during this Lenten season. But three points this morning from Haggai, first part of Haggai. A spiritual inventory. First of all, the prophet came, and he exposed their callousness. They were callous to the things of God. Secondly, the consequences would be examined. There's going to be consequences for their callousness. And finally, he's going to challenge them to get going. So let's look at, first of all, the first point. Callousness is exposed. And uh, look at these first few verses. Thus says the Lord of hosts, This people says the time has not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? And so Haggai comes to the leaders of uh, these people, the political leader and uh, the spiritual leader, Z Zerubbabel and Joshua. He comes to them and he says, okay, these people have got to get back to the work. And he exposes uh, their values and their priorities. Notice what he says here. The Lord of hosts is the one addressing them. I love that. Because if you study that phrase, that designation for God, the Lord of hosts is the Lord of the armies. 
These people are in spiritual battle. Our hearts are in danger of drifting. Our hearts are in danger of just turning to the things of the world and just being swept away for 20, 30, 60, 80 years. And so he calls on the Lord of the armies because this is a spiritual battle for the soul of these people. The Lord of the hosts comes to the people. And then notice he says, here's what the people are experiencing. This people says, I like that, that I circled that word this because he didn't say my people said my people are feeling, he said, this people, that people. Why? Because they're out of fellowship with God. Now they're still his people, but right now they've drifted away. <clears throat> this people says, what? Hey, the time hasn't come for us to work on the house of the Lord. Can you see just their callousness, their coldness exposed here? The house of the Lord was the focal point of Judah's relationship with God. This was signifying that, hey, we're in close connection. Why? Because we're coming to the house. We're worshiping God. We're going through uh, the things that we do to show God that we're serious about our faith. So the prophet's exposing their cold condition. And then notice in the last part, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? Well, this house, God's house, lies desolate. Paneled houses. Some versions say sealed houses. Paneled houses of the day were a sign of luxury because they had to import the wood to get wood to build these houses. But not only did they just build houses, but they put this wainscoting covering on the walls and the ceilings. If you walked into somebody's house and the ceiling was covered, it's like, whoa, this is luxury here. These people have arrived. They must have worked at John Deere. <laughs> it was a sign of luxury when they had their houses paneled, when they had the walls and the ceilings covered over. And Haggai comes to them and says, wait a minute. Here's what the people are saying. The house of the Lord is lying desolate, but we're going to go work on our own houses. For 15 years, that was, the, that was the story. Their priorities were off. And Haggai says, it's time to get back in the game. It's time to endure the opposition. It's time to press on for the sake of God's gospel and the kingdom. You've got to press on. So we have to ask the question this morning. If Haggai did an assessment of our heart, where would God be at in our priority list? Where, how much would we value the things that he values? I heard somebody say one time, if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? That's pretty, that's kind of a hard statement, isn't it? If we were put up in front and said, you're on trial for being a Christian, now, somebody had to lay out the evidence in our life. They do this, they don't do that, they do this, they value that. Would there be enough evidence to prove that we're a Christian? It's easy to get cold. It's easy to be drawn into the material things of our world. And I face that same tension. I think we all do. I remember when I was in Bible college and I worked at a church in Kansas City as an intern. They wanted me to do outreach and discipleship in this church. This church had been around for a good long time. It was a very established church. And it was a it was a good-sized congregation. So they brought me on to do discipleship. They brought another a college student on to do um, youth, to work with the youth. I remember going to the first uh, uh, board meeting, and here's what they said. Hey, by the way, there's a spending freeze. And I'm, shaking, I'm kind of scratching my head like, wait a minute. You're bringing on two new interns to work on outreach and discipleship and to ramp up our youth ministry, but you're not going to give us any money to do it? Is that what you're saying? This was a beautiful building in Kansas City. This was a thriving conversation or con congregation. You go into the parking lot and there was a lot, and I'm not being judgmental, I'm just stating the fact, there was a lot of really, really nice cars. And I knew where some of these people lived, and their houses were very, very, very nice. 
But yet the congregation wasn't giving to the work of God. Now there's a spending freeze and we can't do ministry because we don't have any funds. So it's easy to deceive ourselves. It's easy to get caught up in materialism without even knowing it. And we live in a world that's so materialistic that it's just easy to be swept away, become cold, to hibernate spiritually. Right across this article that I think kind of illustrates this, we might find it humorous, but I think in some cases it might be close to truth. So a man was traveling down the highway in his Mercedes when suddenly he found himself heading for the ditch and the car proceeded to roll over many times. Finally landed on its top. When the police arrived, they came to the man who was lamenting over his car and agonizing over its destruction. I had $50,000 worth of options on this car. I can't believe it's wrecked. Police tried to calm him and point to a worse situation, the loss of his right arm. As the man looked down, he cried out to see that his arm was missing with these words of lament. But where's my Rolex watch? I can't bear to let it go. <clears throat> now that's funny, we laugh at that, but sometimes we put a lot of emphasis on our material things. So that's where these people were at. And so the prophet comes and says, here's your callousness. But notice that he goes on in the he, ex he examines their consequences. There's consequences when we get off track spiritually. There was consequences for these people when they drifted away and weren't concerned about the things of God. And this is kind of a poetic way of saying the same thing as we read through these verses. That all our effort is in vain without God's blessings. So notice what he says here. He talks about the personal blessings that God was withholding because these people were walking close to him. It said, now therefore, that thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, but you harvest little. You eat, but there's not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there's not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but not one is warm enough. And he who, has, he who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with holes. A poetic statement, or several of them, that just showing us that if we're not walking close to God... Um, we don't, he doesn't have to bless. These people fail to give God first place in their lives. And their work wasn't productive and fruitful because of it. And they were finding that the material things just weren't satisfying. They were spinning their wheels, so to speak. They had so much, but they had so little without God's favor. You ever feel like that? used to say when we were raising kids that um, when I looked at the checkbook at the end of the month that there wasn't enough paycheck for the month. Did you catch that? Not enough paycheck to last for the month. Came up short. It's hard to pay the bills. And that's the way these people were. He said they were getting their paycheck on Friday, they were putting it all in a bag, but the bag had a hole in it. So by the time they carried it to their house, it's all gone. Why? They weren't receiving God's blessings. Because it was all about them. They were living for themselves. I think it's sad when I think about living in America. I mean, I love living in America, and we're the most blessed people on the globe. But what I find sad in America is because we're so blessed, sometimes we're so unhappy. You know, I think about the, the people that I know that wrestle with you know, anxiety and worry and fear. You know, marriages uh, coming to an end because of all the stress. People committing suicide. We live in the greatest country in the globe with all these material blessings. Shouldn't we be the happiest people on earth? Not always. Because sometimes this lure of materialism just draws us in and makes us promises, and then it just doesn't come through. Notice the next statement about uh, the consequences these people were experiencing. The common blessings, just the common blessings every person experiences was coming up short. He says, you look for much, but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies desolate while each of you runs to his own house. 
Therefore, because of you, the sky has withheld its dew and the earth has withheld its produce, I called for a drought on the land. So he said, even the common blessings that we receive, all of us, are falling short because the people of God were disobedient. There's consequences when we're not walking close to him. So the physical drought here was shining a light on the spiritual drought of God's people. Notice the third point then. He gives them a challenge. It's time to get back to work. It's time to get with it. And the challenge is this. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies, or the spiritual battle, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and rebuild the temple, that I may be pleased and glorified, says the Lord. Notice that phrase, consider your ways. Consider your ways, it means take a spiritual evaluation. It literally means give careful thought to your path or set your heart on your roads. Set your heart on your roads. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? But it's like our heart is the seat of our emotions, our will, our values, our, all that. He says, I want you to take your heart and I want you to place it on the road and evaluate what are you putting all your heart into? Consider your ways. Take a spiritual pause. Evaluate where you're at. Where you come from. Where are you currently at? Where's God leading? Are you walking in step with him? And whenever I do that, it's amazing what God says. When we take a heartfelt, deep look at ourselves, and we do that through prayer, we ask God, and then we have to listen, right? And then we open up this. Do you know what this is? It's a Bible. <laughs> but, in a spiritual sense, this is a floodlight into your heart and soul. When you open this book, God knows what we need to hear. It exposes areas in our life that need to be shored up. It encourages us when we're on the right track, and it draws us into a close relationship with God. So when we spend time taking an inventory, when we spend time in God's Word, when we spend time in prayer, which, I don't know about you, but that's the, those are the first two things that go when I have a busy schedule. Because I don't have to do them. Well, I should and so we need to spend time taking a spiritual inventory. We need to spend time in this book. We need to spend time praying and listening to God so he can expose the areas or priorities that might be a little out of kilter. I heard somebody say one time that God can't pour his blessings in hands already full. He can't pour his blessings in hands that are already full of the things of the world. And a lot of those things are good. But they just take up too much of our time and our priorities. <clears throat> so we need to recommit to spiritual blessings. So what he said, notice what he says here. Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and rebuild the temple. In other words, get back to work. Get back to the priorities that I gave you. Get back to this close relationship with you. And maybe during this Lent season, it's time to recommit our lives to him. And just saying, I'm going to walk close to you. I'm going to surrender my heart to you again. So he says, get back on track. Why? Because we can impact the next generations who are watching us and coming after. And then notice the last part of this challenge. God says that I might be pleased and glorified. You know, God's pleased when we walk close to him. You know, in Matthew uh, 6, 33, it says, Jesus said, seek first. God's kingdom and his righteousness and all the rest of the things will fall into place. Or 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. When God says that he's going to be glorified, it means the spotlight now is turned away from us and is turned back to him. That's what it means to glorify God. Put him back in the spotlight. Make God number one. <clears throat> So we talked about this at the beginning, but I think this is a good way to, to turn this uh, message to an end. I said our priorities and choices have the potential 
to affect generations to come. You know, our spiritual heart condition just doesn't affect us. It affects our neighbors, our family, our friends, all those people that God wants us to have a part in their life spiritually. So look at this question. How many people may be missing out on God's blessings because of our apathy and inactivity? Have we become like that ground squirrel? <laughs> just eating up everything around us and slowing way down, getting really cold and falling asleep? Spiritually, hope that's not where God finds us. But the good news is, if it is, He just says, "Hey, let's just get back at this together. I'm going to walk with you and help you <clears throat> to finish strong." And notice as we look at this passage in Haggai 1:14, this is where the people ended. So it says, "The Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, that was the leader." In the spirit of Joshua, another leader, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people, and what did they do? And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. Don't you love that? They got back to work. They did what God wanted them to do. And just as a side note, that phrase stirred up literally means to wake up, to bring out of a sleepy state. <laughs> stirred them up, and they got back to work. So that's my encouragement this morning. Let's just make sure that we evaluate where we're at spiritually. Let's let God speak to our hearts and spend time with him. And then if he nudges us a little bit, let's just do what they did. They just got back on track as the Lord stirred them up. So let's ask God to help us do that, shall we? Father, thank you for this passage in Haggai. It's so relevant to my life, I know, and probably others in the room. Thank you, Father, that you don't give up on us, that you have a plan and a purpose for our lives, and ultimately that's to bring pleasure and glory to you, to uh, draw other people along in their spiritual walk and point them to Christ. Thank you, Jesus, that you are patient, that you walk with us, that you help us, and even when we uh, get a little bit um, off track or we become cold or sleepy spiritually, God, that you are always there inviting us to wake up and to get back in the game, and then you encourage us and bless us as we go and serve. So, Father, help us to be faithful as we do that. Help us to listen for your still small voice and to follow where you're leading. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Mark, for that encouraging word, motivating word. It's a good idea, isn't it? Spiritual inventory. And I think it's uh, necessary in any sort of business, in a successful business, inventory is taken uh, from time to time. So we need to do that very <coughs> very often as uh, followers of Christ. And uh, a song that we're going to conclude with, Revive Us Again. May that be our prayer and our desire that we are uh, revived and will be revived day by day. <laughs>